I'm now very happy to, to kick off the, the second session uh, of our esteemed pre presentations. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to welcome Jörg, uh, Jörg Becker, uh, to the stage, um, who uh, will give a presentation uh, on recent uh, research uh, of his group. You may come to the front and uh, I will uh, try to say some words uh, on the impressive uh, CV of Jörg. Uh, Jörg is a professor uh, at the University um, of uh, Münster uh, and he's uh, the director uh, of the information systems department uh, there. Uh, many of us uh, will know him, he's also the academic director uh, of the European Research Center for Information Systems uh, and uh, Liechtenstein, for instance, is also part of this network. Um, uh, so some of you may have been uh, quite exposed also to the, the ARSIS um, network. Jörg is also Prorektor, uh, so Vice President of the University of Münster, which is the third biggest university of Germany. Uh, so he has quite some responsibilities in that regard as well uh, and he is certainly leading uh, one of the most influential uh, information systems uh, research groups uh, in Germany, Europe and, uh, and beyond. Uh, quite a lot of business process management research in particular evolved and emerged uh, from uh, his team uh, and quite a, a few renowned scholars uh, in the field which are already here today, also here today, or uh, with whom we are working uh, on a global scale, actually evolved from uh, Jörg's uh, inspiration and his team. So uh, I'm very grateful, Jörg, that you uh, uh, made your way here to Liechtenstein. Very much enjoy working with you and your, your team, uh, and I very much look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Jörg. Yeah, thank you, Jan. <coughs> and, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> dear colleagues, dear professionals in the business process management area, thank you for listening to me, I'm finished. <laughs> yeah, I'm finished because I have nothing to say. Uh, Cornelius Clausen said, it's about relevance, not standardization. And Tim uh, Will van der Aal said, models are nonsense. I wanted to talk about standardization <laughs> and process models. <laughs> so there's no reason to talk anymore. But fortunately, Tobias Röltz helped me a little bit because he said, when Hilti started to standardize, that was the beginning of the success. And at the end, Will said, and then we have to compare the SES models with the to be models. Ah, thank God, I can talk about my topic. And um, yeah, it is about standardization. And the problem with many, many of these business process models is lacking standardization. We once did a project with the German Department of Def Defense. So, quite a big company. Um, and they wanted to introduce SAP, or this little software from this garage in, near, near Heidelberg, and they thought, it's software, so we give it to the IT department. And then the IT department was working for two years, and then they recognized, gee, it's not only software, it's organization. So they hired all these companies that deal with organizations or the Accentures and IBMs and bearing points and baggers of this world, and they were drawing process models. And at least they, they were using one process modeling techniques. But the problem was that these process models did not fit together. The ones were on a very aggregated level, 
The other ones were very, very detailed. The ones were annotated with input-output data. The other ones were not. Ones were annotated with organizational units. Others were not. So nothing really fit together. And then the uh, project manager uh, listened to a talk I was giving about project management for process management. So if you are interested in that, there is a book about process management. To read that, so you will learn a little bit about that. Um, and he said, that's a very, very good idea. Uh, please harmonize our process models. That was a tough task. So they had about 1,200 process models at that time. And first of all, we were looking at them from a syntactical aspect. They were all in the event-driven process chain by the ARIS architecture. And, you know, there are very few rules. Namely, it's a bipartite graph. So functions and events uh, alter. And there are some connectors like XOR and IOR and AND. And there are uh, some, some ways how to connect process models. That's all. Out of these 1,200 process models, two, in words, two were syntactically correct. 1,198 were syntactical wrong, so at least one syntactical error. The best thing was 71 syntactical errors on one page. I didn't know that that was possible. It is. So we started uh, uh, then doing it syntactically right, but then it was syntactically right. It doesn't mean it was semantically right. And all what it process models are for is semantics, it's not syntax. Syntax is a prerequisite, but the, the question of process models is semantics. And then to, to try to harmonize it, we had a convention book. So with the guidelines of modeling, I uh, presented in 95 with the guideline of clarity, guideline of syntactical and semantic correctness, guideline of economic efficiency, and there are more guidelines, for example, by uh, Will van der Aal, Sayo Reyes, and Jan Mentling, the seven uh, uh, principal uh, modeling uh, guidelines. Uh, and, and this book of, of 120 pages was a good guideline, but it's not the end of process modeling. I mean, who would read a 100-page book before just starting? And even if you have a book like that, believe me, nobody cares. So there are many companies all over the world who do have guidelines about how to model processes. And if you look at the process models, the first thing you see, it's not according to the guidelines. So that cannot be the end of process modeling. Um, and, and I do believe, Will, that looking what's going on it's, it's great, it's very fruitful, it's how to learn how the process models are right now. And it's very helpful. But at the end, do you want to stick to the models and to the processes, not to the models, to the processes like they are? It's great to know how the cows walk. But if you want to build an Autobahn for automobiles, 
maybe the ways of the cows are not the right ones. So if, if you want to change things, if you want to be creative, then on the basis of how processes are, you have to create new models. You have to create new worlds, new possible worlds. And uh, to create possible new worlds, I still am convinced that process models are a very good means to do that. But you have to have the right kind of models and the right kind of modeling techniques. And what we have so far in place, BPMN, or the event-driven process chain by Ares, or Adonis, or SOM, or you name it, in the essence, they are all the same. They are pure syntactical modeling languages. You have little boxes, and what you put into the boxes, it's up to the modeler. And if you ask five modelers to model the same thing, the same piece of reality, you normally come up with five different models. That's bad. And that was our idea of bringing more semantics, pre-semantics, if you want so, into the models, and to deal with standardizing models. And especially in a digital, digit, digitalized world, it's a, it's quite difficult word for Germans, um, it's very, very helpful. If you want to digitalize processes, you have to create new things and you have to formalize it at least a little bit. And you have to think and to change models and processes before you automate them. If you automate nonsense, it's automated nonsense, but it keeps nonsense. So what you have to do first, eliminate. Eliminate everything that is not necessary to fulfill the task the company stands for. Eliminate. Second, simplify, and then automate. In this sequence. Now having left five minutes, I'm coming to my talk. <laughs> but I will finish in time. So that does not work. That works. Standardizing is finding the right level of abstraction. I don't know if, the, if you know the, the graphics of Picasso of the Bulls. If not, look at the internet or in the Museum of Münster, the uh, 12 bulls of Picasso. There are about finding the right level of abstraction. At the end, it's just one piece of drawing, and you see that it's a bull. There's nothing but one piece of drawing, and you see it's a bull. So it's, it's about finding the right level of abstraction. Traction. And we, we were working quite a bit in the uh, retail area. So my example now comes from the retail area. Uh, last night I was talking to uh, Michael, uh, who is following me on, on the stage, uh, and we were thinking if we uh, should change our talk. So I, I was going to talk about ships and airplanes and ports and hear about retail, but I think we stick to our topic. So retail uh, is the, the area I'm talking about. And we start with the famous retail age. So in German, it's Handel. So it's very, very good that it comes up with an age. On the left-hand side, you see everything that is related to the supplier. On the right-hand side, you see everything that is related to the customer. The thing in between the goods receipt, warehousing, goods issue, that deals with the logistics. 
The age itself, these are the core processes of retail. In the bottom, we have the supporting processes, and in the roof, the managing and coordinating uh, processes. And whenever we talk to retailers, they agree. Okay, yeah, that's the way we work, that's the way we are, that's the way we do. Um, so starting with a, with a framework helps understanding what the business is for. Uh, and then we brought more semantics into this whole area of process modeling. By defining that every element of the framework is a main process. This is a setting, that is a definition, but it helps understanding how retailing works. And we are sticking to quite easy process models, not making it too complicated, and bringing more of the uh, semantics and, and, and the differences into attributes, and not bringing it into the model itself. Every element of the main process is a detailed process, and all the process steps are described in process building blocks. So we defined a complete process model for retail with these 17 main processes and about uh, 50 uh, detailed processes and about 500 process steps. And most of the retail companies, and we did it with big ones, with Lidl and Aldi, and with smaller ones like Blumenrisse, which is a flower uh, retailer, and they say, yeah, we understand that. That's what we are. And the description uh, and the differences are in the process steps. It's not in the process itself. So finding the right level of abstraction, that's uh, where we are uh, dealing with quite a bit. So there's something about the syntax. So every process step is described by activity and business object. And there's a glossary for all business objects and a glossary for all activities. So if you want to add a new activity, you have to stick to the activities and the uh, uh, business objects that are in the glossary. There's a lot of things described in, in attributes. So every mo uh, element of the framework is a main process. Every element of the main process is a detailed process. If there are variants or branches, that's quite easy. And every element is described somehow, can be a little movie, can be a word document, can be a decision table, can be something. So we are very free in, in that, and sometimes it's easier to describe something in half a page of Word document than in a very detailed, formalized uh, process models that nobody than the one who has invented this piece of process model uh, could understand. So if you have the guidelines of modeling, before we had naming conflicts, homonyms, synonyms, more and more. Uh, and since we have this glossary, uh, there are no more naming conflicts. In many of these process models you see, there is no orientation, no structure. With our proposal, we have this predefined four layers. And I'm not discussing anymore with retailers if they need two layers or five layers or ten layers. We say it's four layers, and that helps. And that really helps. <laughs> and at the end, they, they all agreed. At the end, they all agreed. Uh, in, in normal uh, process models, you see quite high complexity. We tried to define simple processes and put a lot of these more complex things into the attributes. And uh, before we had the correction of defects, a posteriori, and this does not occur any longer. The basis is that we did about, I don't know, 40 projects with, process mo uh, with, with retail companies so to understand how really retailers uh, work. Um, 
the models are quite easy, adaptable. Um, we have a tool for that as well, uh, which is completely work-based. And I hope we got to improve transparency to allow to come up with good definitions of new possible worlds in a digitalized world. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Jörg, for uh, your insightful and powerful talk uh, on, on this important topic. Um, any comments from the audience, questions? Yes, please. Stin. I really enjoyed your talk, um, but you must have some quite heated debates with enterprise architects, which typically use a much broader nomenclature of uh, of terminologies like um, just the other day at the uh, Airme UK uh, conference where we had a, a, gr a big group of uh, BPM specialists and a big group of enterprise architects and they were fighting over what a capability actually meant in the process world and what it meant in the uh, enterprise architecture world. How would you solve that with your, uh, with your framework? Uh, I had a talk uh, three weeks ago on, on a big... Uh, Enterprise Architecture Conference, I think the ideas of standardizing process models fit perfectly mm -hmm. into the idea of enterprise architecture and business architecture. So th there are uh, different things in, in an enterprise archi architecture and processes are, are a very uh, important part of the enterprise architecture. So I, I think it, it fits perfectly um, and it has to be combined with all the other aspects of uh, the, the whole enterprise architecture, but I think it's a perfect basis. So I, I do not have any doubt that uh, good business process models can be integrated and should be the basis for the whole enterprise architecture. And, and could you define a capability, an organizational capability, in function of what you just presented? Um, the, the capabilities, sure, are part of the strategy of the company. So if you want to be the most cost-efficient retailer, you stick to different uh, instances of uh, the, the business uh, processes in a very specific way. So we have some proposal for that that I could not explain in detail. Uh, uh, I just want to bring the, the idea. Or if you want to be uh, the one who has uh, the strongest interaction with your customer. So there are different instances of the uh, process steps. Um, so according to your, your strategy and your, according to your strategy, you have to, to build up your capabilities and to define these capabilities as part of the pro uh, process model. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uwe? So thank you for your presentation. From my experience in a lot of companies, a few people are uh, aware of this methodology and know how to design processes and they are the experts in the syntax but not in the semantics. And they are designing, modeling these processes for all the others who are really the experts in the semantics. And then you see the gap that it doesn't work really. And how does your approach help these experts to model these processes and to involve them, what's really important from my point of view. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is kind of reference model, a blueprint for companies. And there are a lot of, of uh, consulting companies who ask me to have that as a basis for their projects. Or there are a lot of, uh, uh, not a lot of, it just starts, a few software companies who uh, document their software in these very uh, 
yeah, easy, simple uh, uh, kind of, of uh, process models. So we don't want to stick with them and say that's ours. We want to bring it into the world and the more uh, uh, consulting companies use it, the happier we are. And the next steps are now not having it only for retail companies, but also for manufacturing company, for we're working with banks quite intensively right now to have a reference model for, for banks and the uh, bank processes for insurance companies. So that will go on uh, to, to have the idea of reference models that hold true for quite a few uh, companies that are in the structure uh, like the same and the more you use it, I think the more helpful it is. Thank you very much. Further? Yeah, Will? There was another out there. Yeah. Now, Will will say that process mining is the more important thing and then designing new processes <laughs> is less important. Of course. Of course. Uh, <laughs> to, to follow up on the previous question, uh, uh, so, so, so that there is indeed a problem that uh, BPM is only a few experts know about it and look at it. And I think one of the reasons for that is that uh, process models, or in general the models that we make, only few people view them. And it would also not be interesting to let more people view them yeah. if we look at them at design time. I think if the process is running and we breathe life into these models by continuously projecting information on them, then I think there will be an awareness of a bigger community of people to look at these models. That is just like you look at TomTom, Tom, you see the traffic jams. You would like to look at models and yeah. see the traffic jams in the models. Yeah. So re related to that comment, uh, you, s you stress the notion of semantics, which I fully agree with. But it seems very much at the uh, design and implementation side. Whereas uh, I think it's very important that companies also record in a semantically correct way what they actually did, that you can reconstruct uh, failures in the past to learn from them. So, so can, can you comment yeah. on that? Uh, I, I totally agree. There, there is no dissent at all. Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, it's designing, and then it's confirming that the, the uh, uh, process methods that are lived are uh, fit to, to, to the, or otherwise, as you said, so we do not disagree at all, as, as you said, uh, if there are deviants, deviances, is the model wrong or is reality wrong? And sometimes reality is wrong. So uh, if, if you have some, some rules in your company that if there is a, a order more than 50,000 euros, then four people have to look at it, or two or seven. And they do not do that. Then reality is wrong, <coughs> because it's not uh, according to the uh, governance rules. Yeah. So follow up on that, I think it's like actually guidelines of modeling. It would be very nice to have guidelines of logging. Yes, right? yes. How you record yes. what actually happened. Yes, absolutely. Very yeah. nice. Very nice. It, pr it probably goes in circles, right? You you start with a certain high level understanding a reference model, then you look into kind of what's actually happening, use that to refine also your your reference model, and probably this is then a continuous journey of improving and, and learning about kind of the processes, right? Very nice. Uh, with respect to time, I'm sorry I need to to cut uh, this discussion short, uh, but uh, we definitely have plenty of time to discuss with Jörg uh, also in the breaks and. Uh, thank you very much, Jörg, once again. Um, warm applause. So it's uh, my great pleasure to uh, welcome the second speaker here in this uh, second session, uh, Mikael Lind from uh, Sweden. Um, Mikael is uh, an uh, associate professor um, with the Victoria Swedish ICT. Uh, Institute, uh, as well as with uh, Chalmers uh, University of Technology. Uh, and uh, he's a research manager of uh, the Sustainable Transport Group at Victoria, Swedish ICT, uh, and heads uh, initi initiatives uh, in particular looking into open innovation related to ICT, sustainability, and transportation. 
Um, and probably kind of from uh, knowing the abstract, from talking uh, to Mikael, from knowing him, him over years, um, he will give a fascinating presentation which probably adds uh, an element uh, which uh, we have not discussed so much um, uh, until now, which is the notion of the ecosystem. Right? So we kind of maybe, but I don't want to go too far into your presentation, but we kind of uh, uh, invite you on a journey now uh, looking from one organization or two organizations onto the wider ecosystem uh, within organizations. Is that right at all? Yep. <laughs> Mikael, uh, we will hear in a minute uh, from Mikael. Thank you very much for being here. I very much look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Jan. Uh, this is not a presentation about retailing then. <laughs> I know some parts of retailing, but I think that I will try to stick to my... Aviation and shipping industry, I think, is extremely fascinating. Um, and as Jörg said, I'm not really sure if I'm in the right place either, because uh, I would like to talk about multi-actor, multi-actor collaboration, uh, where I see the business process is spanning uh, over several organizations. I have a, a severe problems when I have a ship agent saying that I earn money, money on a non-transparent situation. I don't want to share any information at all. I don't want to share any data. That means that it's, it's extremely tricky to capture the processes in that situation. Uh, ecosystem innovation, uh, and this project is actually based from when Michael Roseman uh, and I went up to Stockholm Arlanda Airport and sold a product called Future Airports, and that was inspired from QUT by the airports of the future, 16 airports collaborating in, in uh, deriving uh, best, practice, uh, best, best practices from, from how to run an airport. And I thought that this is going to be so cool and uh, the airport is going to know everything about uh, so on. And it seems to, and it, what came out was that it's a lot of collaboration. So luckily, I had all this BPM and 2.0 models where I could uh, have all the swim lanes and I could model back and forth and see. And suddenly I saw that the airport is not meeting the passenger. There was only one touch point with the passenger and that was the information desk. And I suppose how many of you have in here when you went to, went to the airport last time, went to the information desk? Probably none of you, because the services were provided by others. So how do you regulate that? Taxi companies are screaming after you as a customer. Uh, there are multiple uh, stakeholders running around. They are competitors, uh, and, and they want to grasp you. They close doors. They put, uh, put sofas in, 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 so that you cannot uh, get to the right taxi lane because you would like to, to have a, a really open competition situation, etc., etc. Uh, okay, so um, let's see if I can. <laughs> let's do like that. So uh, what we are basically saying is that that. Uh, the multimodal transportation system involves multiple actors. It is a co-production of value among several stakeholders that pay an interest and share a common object of interest, the passenger flow. I think it's extremely important that you manage to model and describe and show how the passenger flow looks like and also thereby can, can improve it in a good way. But that needs to become uh, that you manage to match the goals and the objectives of a single organization to the transportation system as a whole. Um, so uh, what we did was that we tried to distinguish where does it start and where does it end. And uh, luckily when you work with Stockholm Arlanda Airport, they push, they are the toughest environmental requirements in the world for an airport. 1991, it was set 350,000 tons of carbon dioxide that you could let out uh, from airport operations, and that includes transportation to and from the airport. So when I drive my car to the airport, they will be uh, taxed on, on the, the, the amount of carbon dioxide that you let out. So that means that each innovation that they are providing needs to be environmentally friendly. So they introduced tax, uh, taxi remote, for example, so that it's only environmental taxis that can pick up passengers and leave passengers at the airport. That changed the whole uh, system of, of carbon dioxide uh, um, pollution in the Stockholm area, because the taxi companies had to change taxis. And that, of course, went into strike, and, and uh, the, the guy who came up with this idea, he was murder-threatened, etc., etc. So there was a lot of uh, resistance in that kind of situation. 
this is just a map, and uh, maybe that goes back to uh, Will's uh, question, saying that, okay, this was a way that I managed to communicate with the people. This is how the models look like, in, instead of being very deep into, but this is what we are trying to cover. There are severe ways to go, get to back into from the airport, and there's a lot of things with discretionary activities and, and, and um, what do you call it, and compulsory activities. And very interesting with an airport is that you do not meet the passenger suddenly before the passenger is at the gate. That's the, that's the first time you have information about the passenger. Nowadays, former days, you had this uh, counter where you checked in, where you physically were at the airport, but nowadays you can check in at home with your phone, etc. Et so, so, so the pilot doesn't know whether you will be at the, at the, at the flight. And that, of course, stresses the question of, of uh, what, what will happen. So what we did was that we developed a, a, an idea of an ecosystem with a door-to-door with a, with a -door perspective uh, as a common object of interest. And just let me show you a movie that we utilized in order to actually get the mindset of people from the different organizations to actually start thinking about, uh, about uh, this from a larger, larger point of view. So let's see if this works now. Uh, is that right, Teresa? Whoops. So this is about a passenger that is booking his trip now. At the bottom you see a status bar, it's already checked in at two airports. He comes to the first airport, now he's security checked. There's a lot of services that could be provided for the passenger at the airport. Movie, eating. You have a future transfer airport. And wasn't that great? There was a desk there also that he could sit and work because somebody reflected his needs on the way over there. Having food again, etc., etc. And now arriving to the, to the destination. The taxi company comes and picks him up because he has ordered that before. And there's, of course, different means of transportation, and he ends up in Paris. Uh, I could continue the story, and of course, a door-to-door -door perspective means that you will travel back and forth. Uh, but now, since I don't have so much time, I will uh, continue with my uh, presentation here. Uh, we'll see how we do this. There we go. So, uh, basically, uh, what I would like to push a lot for is that uh, we have a situation, if you want to be acting in a larger ecosystem, you need to start thinking about which are the data streams, really, that could provide me as an organization uh, a way to think about uh, how, how I can provide better service for the whole, uh, for this ecosystem as such, and thereby also uh, becoming, uh, becoming a better um, and more competitive partner in, in this situation. Um, and, and uh, as you see here, we have a number of different uh, uh, solutions that we work with, uh, where the motive is successful collaboration, integrated performance or optimal processes, common situational awareness, seamless travel and information sharing. And as you would say in an airport, a queue, when that arrives, that it, then it is already too late. You would like to see whether the line or the queue is going to be there uh, five minutes before, one hour before, two hours before, so that you can do the right capacity management in that situation. Uh, just to uh, connect back to how we uh, thought about this, uh, in Europe we have something called uh, the CESAR program. I don't know if you heard about that. Euro the European Union invested 2.3 billion euro in actually establishing a one single European sky. Meaning that you cannot take off an airplane from one airport without having a slot time in the other end. So it's, it's a, the, the time limit is very strong. It's like five, minus five minutes plus ten minutes in order to make this whole system work. And the pilot is the one who is responsible for, for setting up and taking off the plane. 
Now the thing is that have you you know when you're on the plane, what happens is that that uh, that uh, if somebody comes on the plane and and the baggage is not uh, is on uh, or the passenger is not there but the baggage is on the plane, what happens then? You need to get off uh, get off all the all the luggage and take off that bag and then place the bag bags back again. And that will of course be a delay with more than 10 minutes normally. So uh, what we did was to try to match because this investment of this uh, whole uh, European thing was that actually that you would like to foster a fast turnaround process with all these measures, with target of block time, action of block time, uh, target in block time, etc., etc. But those are meaningless if you don't start to match this with a passenger flow, where you have a number of different uh, also measures that you can utilize, and also the baggage flow. And the interesting thing was that when we entered that scene, there were three absolutely different professions. You know, the guys who are dealing with, with the, passenger, the passenger flow was, the, was the more the, 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 the customer service department kind of thing. The baggage flow, that was extremely mathematical models. How, how do you actually ensure that the bag comes through the whole system and this baggage hotel, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have all the flight people that were actually dealing with the, with the turnaround process. Just by providing that picture, got all people going in, another, in a total another way. And there's so many stakeholders involved in all these processes here in actually enabling this situation. And what they wanted really was that time showing up there, <laughs> that, that uh, larger spot there where you're seeing that, okay, if I optimize all my processes in relation to that situation, then, we can, then, we, then I actually will contribute to the whole ecosystem. So, uh, what we then continue with was to start, uh, and okay, I'm sorry for the dashboard thing. Yes, I would say uh, for us it was very good with the dashboard, but we had to have a strong purpose with the dashboard, saying that if you could, could uh, predict a, a deviation from punctuality, which would the measures be, and which would you as an organization, how can I act in that kind of situation? I had red, yellow, green lights for that situation. Uh, and of course, then that meant that each actor needed to provide data. It is absolutely impossible to get an airline to provide the passenger data. I can tell you that. It's absolutely possible, impossible. But they might say the loading factor, the density factor, you can talk about that. And you can get security. When you scan your barcode, you, they, they actually you can connect that to a certain flight. Suddenly you can see that 80% of the passengers are inside the terminal. Thereby, you can actually make a decision uh, in advance whether you can take the flight can take off in time or not, etc., etc. And then, of course, what we did was that we started to calculate uh, and seeing, okay, here we have a door-to-door -door process with a number of different uh, control points where you can withdraw data that will be uh, uh, sitting on different actors, and you would have a coordinating actor, such as the airport, for example, that has a long uh, uh, different uh, SLAs, with, or service level agreements, with the different actors where you can get them to provide data in a good way, in a, in a common structure, in some, in some way, where you want real-time information. So, um, what we then did was to say that by all this, uh, both static data and dynamic data, we wanted to forecast, simulate what would happen if we do it like this and like this, uh, and, and let different actors be involved in that uh, situation. We would visualize and we would also recommend in order to come into a situation where you have what we call a balanced ecosystem with different providers of information, status of the transportation system, special events, crashes, etc., etc. You would have an information hub channelizing the, all the information uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, that is process-based information, which will recommend both the actor to take certain um, what do you call that? Uh, so certain certain uh, actions, but also the the, 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 the the traveler. I mean, if you would know that there will be a dense dense situation in two hours at that spot, you might take another route, for example, or the actor might recommend you to do something, or the actor might put in more resources into that situation. So, uh, maybe a view a little bit outside. Uh, from 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 uh, from uh, from a single firm perspective, saying that okay, the single firm uh, very many times operates in a much larger 
situation where, where you are normally sharing a common object of interest. Somebody told me that ecosystem innovations is like 4% of all the innovations are more ecosystem oriented. Most of innovations are more firm oriented, market innovations, product innovations, etc. Et and maybe this situation also reflects that a little bit. Maybe, I don't know. So I would be really happy. I mean, I think that BBM and uh, 2.0, the models I've been using there, was a very, very good foundation to actually stimulate the reflection. So where can we put in digital uh, innovations for, for doing this? Nowadays, just a, a small story, is that, that uh, now I'm trying to bring all the ideas from a 70-year-old experience uh, industry, the aviation industry, to the, the industry of shipping. And you know the industry of shipping, when you're talking about remashed lines, they calculate 18 US dollars per delayed second. Do you realize one hour delay in a port where you have so many distribut distribution of actors where these guys actually do not really care a shit about whether the mesh lines is, is, is going in time or not. So this power situation in, in that situation is, is extremely big at the moment. So, that's me. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mikael. Um, very inspiring talk. Uh, it, it's, yeah, uh, perfect. Jan, please, go ahead. Right, so, uh, thank you very much. So, I, I was... I was really thinking about, so when you compare how uh, airports were constructed, like in the 70s, so in Germany we have the airport of Cologne, of Berlin, which have this hexagon layout. And it's very much optimized towards, let's say, um, uh, factors like uh, minimum time, being efficient in transportation on and off. And you look at these airports recently that look pretty much like a mall. So how, how do you, what is your perspective on balancing on the one hand side this commercial perspective with a sustainable perspective, in particular in this area. Uh, yeah, and I hear now that we are talking about ice hockey rinks in airports and so on. So this is kept getting to become some kind of amusement center. How many of you in here uh, do really want to, to spend a lot of time in the airport? Okay, so we are probably the kind of uh, persons, or the kind of uh, actors that actually do not really appreciate those kind of things. What we did in Stockholm Arlanda was that we categorized the different uh, passengers. I think it was four different types. And this was the ordinary business traveler. Uh, those were the ones that would like to park and then run into the airport and you would like, a, like to have a fast lane and 20 minutes you would, should, would like to be sitting in the plane. And you would definitely want to have information about whether the plane is going to be delayed or not. But you also have the families out traveling and, and, the, and, the, and the senior citizens that actually come to the airport three hours in advance. We made one experiment, which is very interesting, is that we opened the check-in desk without say, saying anything to anybody, three hours instead of two hours in advance. What happened was that senior citizens came to the airport three hours in advance. They were so happy about having all this stuff uh, ready-made, so on. The queue was actually reduced for the other guys, who actually were the ones, that, the, the, the kind of business travelers, because they don't, didn't have to mess with all the senior citizens. It's a kind of interesting situation. So it's, it's what, is, what the airport is doing is addressing the diversity. I think that is important. The other thing, what is happening now also, is that uh, it is extremely important for an airport to become up high up on the list uh, when, you, when you make a transfer flight. Is there, um, uh, have anybody flo flown through Chicago? Do you like the airport? It's a mess, right? So uh, my experience is that you don't want to go via Chicago. I go via, via Minneapolis or something else instead, if, I, if, I, if it's necessary. So, uh, and, and uh, I know that in Scandinavia, you're also talking about, I mean, there's a huge competition between Stockholm and Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. And the competition is just about attracting enough airlines to come to the airport and speed up the, the, speed up the uh, turnaround time. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you very much. Jan? In the beginning, you mentioned this sustainability topic, yeah, and the, this notion about that small on the airport that the airport is uh, is liable for for um, the carbon footprint of taxis and cars, etc., and so forth. Now, that's quite interesting. Now, what process do they have in place to do this? I mean, how do they incentivize you to take your bicycle or you and me to car share or whatever else the solution is? Uh, uh, to be honest, first I would say I, I really don't know uh, because uh, the the. Uh, Due to the fact that, that uh, I think that the environmental department is a very 
reactive department, unfortunately. So they are making all the calculations, saying that this is what it turned out to be. Uh, what 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 uh, what has been said is that uh, there are two there are two levels of this, and if you if you reach one of the levels, you have to close down the airport because it's a market uh, court that that uh, or the, no not the market the, the environmental court that sets that. However, each change that is that is uh, proposed in the situation is valued from an environmental perspective and its environmental impact. So that is what's happening, basically. And, and I mean, you know, we also be, we, we wrote a paper on, on, uh, <laughs> on, on how, how you actually connected, what did we call it, uh, green BPM? Uh, that where we actually saw uh, the number of different uh, triggers. I know. <laughs> uh, so, so, so what actually drove uh, the CO2 emission? Very good. Thank you very much. That's another book, yeah? yeah it's <laughs> on a green good BPM. book. <laughs> Okay, further comments, questions? We would have time for uh, one additional common question. Come on. Do we think? Yeah, very good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for your presentation. I just wonder, uh, a so-called municipality decided to have ordinary terrain work through our and uh, it enabled from uh, last winter. Uh, did it happen because of some uh, uh, some environmental friendly decisions? Because uh, it should, it was uh, it could be enabled before, but they postponed it to happen last winter, and uh, it was uh, I think very big debate about environmental situation there. Uh, I, I would say that uh, first of all, the, the whole Swedish attitude is to become a forerunner in, in a CO2 emission uh, or, or keeping that as low as possible. I think that that is what we are doing. Uh, I was standing beside the, the CEO of Dallas Fort Worth uh, giving a talk, and he was so proud of having 16 traffic lanes ge getting people out and in and out of the airport. And I was raising my hand saying, "We drive trains." <laughs> the problem, though. I must also say is that the, the time accuracy of, of the train system is extremely complicated. So uh, Sweden just invested 1.8 billion kroner in a new traffic management system for, for, for train operations to try to increase the punctuality. We'll see what that happens, but people are stealing, you know, the copper from 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 the lines, and and the snow is uh, falling on the lines uh, on the, the power lines, which means that the whole system is collapsing sometimes. And that is, of course, a little bit tricky if you want to go down here and give a talk down here, right? So, because you won't understand. But the beauty, if you can manage the situation where Arlanda Express, if that is broken down, and the taxi companies are informed that that is broken down, so that they can actually drive out to the, to the Arlanda Express and take care of me as a passenger. And that might be a service that the, the airline is providing for me because they want to transport me, for example. That's about nice. information sharing. Very nice, very nice. Thank you very much. I very much like the notion of uh, really um, expanding the scope from one organization to, to really um, whole ecosystems, right? And looking, trying to understand more kind of the, the processes of customers, rather, and then trying to, to align uh, the processes of various organizations within the needs of uh, the customers' processes. And in transportation, of course, you have these lines and chains. Very, very insightful. Thank you very much, Mikael. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great pleasure for me to welcome Jan Mendling here uh, to the stage, next presenter. Uh, he is Professor of Information Systems uh, at uh, uh, WU Vienna, uh, WU University, very famous in China, <laughs> I suppose. Wirtschafts. Uh, <laughs> WU University, uh, Wirtschaftsuniversität is uh, so uh, the translation. Uh, it is an <laughs> economic university. Uh, Jan has made uh, uh, an impressive uh, CV as well. He's uh, made a tremendous career, starting uh, with uh, with, a, with a study uh, master studies in Trier, right, uh, and also Belgium University and uh, graduation in Vienna uh, already. Uh, then uh, he uh, worked at QT, Brisbane, Australia, uh, Humboldt Universität uh, in Berlin, Germany, uh, and has been appointed full professor. Uh, 2011, right? It was uh, uh, and at WU University in Vienna. So uh, he's well known, I think, to the audience. Uh, he's an expert in many fields. He's also 
um, board member uh, and, and, and I think also founding member uh, of the BPM Roundtable uh, in, in Vienna and, and Austria and there's also an association for process management in, in, uh, in, in Austria uh, where, you, um, uh, where you are a board member. Um, so a lot of experience, uh, I'm very much looking forward uh, to your presentation. Jan is also a visiting professor uh, at our university, uh, so also we have uh, good relations. I very much look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I'm sorry that I uh, just have to say a few words upon uh, the institution where I'm coming from, just to clarify this, that nobody, uh, uh, that nobody gets stuck with this uh, abbreviation that you try to pronounce. So we call ourselves VU, and uh, we uh, also use this um, pronunciation when we talk ourselves in English. Uh, which is the abbreviation for Wirtschaftsuniversität. Uh, so the W is not standing for Vienna. Uh, in Vienna there are also other institutions. Uh, there's the University of Vienna, um, and there's also the Technical University. And uh, we need the W to segregate ourselves uh, from these other institutions, so that's referring to uh, Wirtschaft, to business. So uh, thanks a lot uh, for your introductory words. Uh, and. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, discuss uh, in the line of uh, the presenters that we have seen before me um, some research that uh, was conducted uh, by uh, Molika Malinova, who's sitting in the audience, just give us a wave, and uh, myself on, uh, on process maps. And um, essentially we observed that um, um, we have spent from a research side, and I think that also partially relates to practice, uh, very much effort on understanding very detailed models. And uh, we more and more see a need of, uh, that we need to get back at a certain level of, uh, of further abstraction uh, in order to discuss not only a single process, but also in how far uh, several processes of a company relate to one another. So and, uh, there's essentially a need uh, for doing this in an effective manner uh, in order to stimulate all kinds of dis discussions, idea generation, problem solving, etc., which we need uh, for identify potential for innovation. So um, just to illustrate my point a little bit, uh, I want to show something old, because when we talk about change and innovation towards the future, this is something like a delta from today to tomorrow, but of course, there's also a delta from yesterday into today, and it may help us to understand a little bit upon where you're standing. So, who knows this thing here? Has anybody seen this before? And I'm very particularly looking at Hayo. <laughs> um, since uh, what you see here uh, is an old map, apparently, and uh, it shows the world uh, as it was perceived uh, in ancient Greek times. Uh, so this is the P uh, Ptolemaic world map, uh, which was presumably created in the first century after Christ. And you see there, uh, there are different parts of the known world at that point in time. So... Um, Pretty much beyond the uh, arti uh, arti artistic beauty of this map, um, it shows a very limited and um, distorted picture of what the world looks like. And um, pretty much as this, uh, when you have a very distorted uh, picture of uh, how your process map is looking like, uh, that has all kinds of negative effects when you want to discuss certain matters along with this. So imagine... Uh, so you don't have the nice facilities and visualizations that uh, Mikael has. And you're trying to plan a trip uh, to go from, from Stockholm uh, to Istanbul. And uh, you will look at this map and try to understand what would be a good way for getting there. And uh, clearly, uh, the tools and facilities that we have these days in using maps, such uh, as we find them on the internet, as compared to this map, uh, would levers with finding a much more effective way uh, in using the more recent tools. So, uh, from this point, uh, there's a need to understand and discuss in more detail how we actually look at our organization from a process-oriented perspective, which is ab abstract and which leads uh, towards the strategic decision-making. So, many of you will know life cycle models like this, and um, they're essentially very similar, uh, but I think what is the beauty of um, this, um, this cycle uh, that you will find in the blue book is that um, there's something at the very top of it, uh, which is highlighted here, and this is um, 
trying to emphasize that there are two levels upon which you can discuss processes. So on one hand side, you can look into a singular process. This is what's happening in the circle underneath. And there is also a consideration to look not into a single process, but look into an overall representation of how all processes of a company relate to one another. And that's exactly uh, where process maps are uh, located in this overall environment. Process maps try to support discussing how different processes of an organization fit together. So we've seen Jörg's uh, age model for retail. That's exactly on this level of abstraction, where you try to discuss what an organization is doing, and you try to capture this in a way that is understandable um, to all people that are involved with that company. So that may, for instance, look like this. Uh, so I'm now turning uh, to another industry sector. And if you read through this map, um, you might get a rough understanding of what a company that uses this particular map is essentially doing. So we can see that, uh, as with many companies, you see a separation between uh, different categories of processes. So in the middle, you usually find the main process, the most important processes, the core processes of the company. Uh, and here with that company, we see that uh, apparently they are dealing with insurances. So we have uh, here a subcategory to make insurance offers, to make insurance policies, uh, to collect insurance payments, and to handle insurance claims. So apparently we're dealing with an insurance company. What is usually more generic are the things that you find on top or at the bottom of such a visualization, where you can see that there are certain support processes that this company needs to run these core processes. They're shown here at the bottom. Uh, and on the top, you find management processes, which are essentially needed to analyze, to investigate, to essentially think about where the company is moving and uh, take strategic decisions on which company which processes are meant to be used in the future and how these processes are meant to be designed. So, uh, as much as these uh, process maps are nice to, uh, to visualize and to discuss uh, these matters, um, the problem is currently at this stage of investigation um, that process maps are these, uh, these days created more or less from a creative perspective. So, and this is of course a problem, um, so if you are working in the retail sector, for instance, you may be happy to rely on something like, uh, like this uh, Handelshaar model, uh, which is already available, but if you're working in a sector uh, for which there's not such a strong and condensed representation available, how do you go about constructing it for yourself? So, and then, uh, well, essentially, as there are no standards uh, for doing this, um, you need to investigate this relationship uh, by looking into what uh, people are really doing. So this is our hypothesis, that essentially how well you design such process maps will have an implication in on terms of how far people will be able uh, to effectively discuss about certain matters that relate to the overall landscape of processes. So how do you do this as a researcher? Well pretty much in line with what we have discussed in the morning so far. Um, when you do not know, you try to understand and observe how people behave about this in practice. And this was essentially uh, the way how we approached this problem in order to understand uh, in how far we can substantiate these uh, hypotheses. We looked into how people actually create uh, such process maps in practice and uh, which kind of different characteristics we can observe. So if you now take a single second maybe to look a little bit upon these six different visualizations of different companies, uh, you will see there's a huge variety in how far companies approach this task of creating such a process map. So apparently um, there are different, ter different types of visualizations that you can observe here. You see a lot of use of colors and highlightings. There are different symbols being used. And um, there's also different concepts being represented in these maps. And of course, the question is, uh, what is the essential set uh, that makes up uh, the uh, ingredients of defining a language for creating process maps? 
Uh, and in how far helps, uh, is this something that helps us to understand whether a process map can be created effectively. So when you now uh, try to uh, cut this a little bit down and try to systematically uh, separate these different concerns, uh, there would be two things uh, that you would need to talk about. Uh, they relate to primary and secondary notation. So primary notation um, means on the one hand side, uh, we need to under identify and understand what people actually wish to express when they create such a process map. That's a matter of primary notation, essentially meaning we need to understand which are the components that we need to represent in the meta model of a language uh, that helps us to create such process maps. And the second thing is that we observe um, People make excessive use of colors, highlightings, groupings, etc. And there must be a reason why they do so. And that is essentially a matter of secondary notation uh, to investigate in how far uh, we can see effective mechanisms to, uh, that people use uh, to highlight certain matters in these models and make that visible, and more effectively visible uh, to users of such process maps. We also talked about um, already in terms of usage of models and there were some complaints in terms of, well, nobody's looking at these models. Well, essentially for those process map models that we talk about here, this is a very condensed representation that fits on a single uh, PowerPoint slide. And this will be a representation that many people in the company will look at, in particular those people who are more on the strategic side. So you better have these representations to be good. So I want to uh, illustrate this point a little bit um, with insights uh, that we had uh, from a case uh, where we discussed uh, these matters uh, with an insurance company in Austria. And uh, this insurance company uh, used the process map that you can see, well, not exactly, but this is kind of an abstracted version, uh, as you can see it here in the back of us. Um, why, was, why was there actually a need to discuss uh, the process map at all? So apparently, uh, the company felt uh, that their representation of their own business in terms of their processes would not, was not very effective. So uh, they had recognized, uh, and there was a change of uh, the legal environment of that company, uh, that they found, dif found it difficult um, to set up uh, the changes that were required by a new law in Austria um, that allowed uh, customers of that insurance companies to specify um, which uh, capital allocation strategies they would choose. And that essentially uh, changed the whole business uh, from the point of uh, where they simply collect uh, the contributions of the different, um, uh, of the different uh, contributors and allocating that all together. They now need it uh, to separate uh, the different uh, allocation strategies and this is in, had implications for the whole business. So what they try to do is to pin down, uh, with the help of this process map, uh, where uh, this new insurance law might play a role. And you see there, their sales. Apparently for sales, uh, this is something that matters because the interaction with the customer changes and the customer has to further select uh, new options. Uh, actuary um, relates to uh, in how far uh, you make uh, certain calculations in terms of uh, probabilities that you relate to uh, the valuation of the different assets uh, that are kind of calculated down to each of the customer. Apparently that would be also affected pretty much as the administration and the capital allocation. So apparently this process map uh, didn't really help uh, to pin down the problem uh, since according to this representation kind of uh, this problem was everywhere. Um, we also, from our uh, qualitative analysis and discussion with that company, felt uh, that uh, there were certain important matters of that company not being represented in the process map. Uh, so we discussed in how far uh, we would have an opportunity to uh, change this process map towards a more appropriate representation of what the business does. Uh, this led to a, a new process map uh, that you see uh, represented here not the exact one, but an abstracted one. And um, uh, certain matters, uh, which I will not discuss in more detail, is that uh, they, we applied certain guidelines in how far certain things needed to be represented. 
Um, and these representational guidelines led to the fact uh, that we in the court business uh, could distinguish uh, three different life cycles of major entities that were relevant for this company. So there was apparently a cycle uh, relating to every of the activities that related to the recipients of those contributions. So that is when you kind of retire, you get uh, contributions. When you're not yet retired, you provide contributions. Uh, there's the level of the customer, uh, which may sound a little bit strange in the first place. And it was also a matter that um, took us uh, uh, three or four sessions until we understood it in the discussions with them. Um, that apparently uh, the recipients were not the customers, but the customers are the companies who employ people that will be recipients or contributors. And uh, that was important in this sense uh, that the sales uh, was completely focusing uh, on, um, on these uh, customers, so the companies that were actually um, making their employees registered with, these, uh, with this insurer. So, and finally, uh, this is what you can see at the very top. Uh, that is the uh, sphere of what is called the communities there. Uh, so, these are different uh, asset allocation strategies and classes in how far they needed to represent um, uh, where they need to make uh, allocation, uh, where they need to materialize allocation strategies and uh, need to decide which assets are being bought, which investments are being made, and which kind of assets are being sold. So the point is now um, that uh, with many companies, uh, you observe uh, that actually uh, the major frictions are between those handover points, between such major cycles of major entities. So uh, the biggest problems were essentially aligning those processes that relate to the recipients with those that relate to the customers, and those processes that relate with the recipients uh, towards the processes of uh, the asset allocation of the communities. Uh, this, this was something that um, helped to discuss here uh, with this different representation more explicitly. And uh, we also used this to discuss in more detail where this um, new, say, uh, new law would actually have the most impact. And uh, we were able to pin this down much more explicitly and kind of trimming down the problem space. So I hope this uh, gives you a little bit of an idea uh, in how far these very abstract maps uh, are very important for decision making on a, on a very strategic level and that the design of these maps uh, have a strong impact in how far you can really discuss certain matters. So my takeaways for you uh, would be on the one hand side, well, clearly as others had said before today, we need to know where we stand uh, in order to know uh, where we can move. And um, those abstract representations in terms of uh, the process maps are very important. Uh, so try to make sure uh, that you design them appropriately. And uh, there are established guidelines. If you're interested in this, uh, please contact us so that we can discuss with you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan, uh, for your inspiring talk. Um, any questions, comments? Yes, please, Jörg. Uh, as you may uh, imagine, I love process maps. <laughs> they are really very, very... Thank you. They are really very, very helpful. Um, and I love structures. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I uh, looked at your last uh, process map, can, can you uh, get it on the... I was wondering why the... Um, uh, the, the pieces of uh, processes are on, on different distances from each other. Is there semantics behind it? Probably there is, but I couldn't figure it out. Yes, uh, you're exactly right. Um, so when you create such process maps, uh, you should be sure that everything is interpreted with a certain meaning. And uh, if not, that can be very distracting. So. Um, uh, these positionings, uh, they, have been, uh, they have been used uh, by the people of the real process map team. So uh, there must be some meaning, uh, but this was not revealed to us. So they really made it on purpose uh, to position these things uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this positioning. So uh, uh, there must be a certain notion of distance, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Very good, thank you very much. Great observation. <laughs> Hi -o. 
Um, Jan, uh, you told us uh, a, little, um, a lot actually about the design of uh, process maps. Um, I can imagine that organizations who comfortably work with these process maps at some point also want insights in how they keep up with developments within the organization or actually outside the organization to organize their, their process maps. So in that sense, it's a, it's a certain matter of maintenance or updating these things. Is there, a, uh, can you give me your perspective on how you are going to address that challenge? Is there any, how could you exploit certain sources of knowledge or information or dynamics to do that stuff? Uh, yeah, uh, two answers to this. Uh, first answer is uh, an observation of what organizations really do. Um, those organizations that we have been in touch with, uh, they tend to say uh, we have to update these uh, high-level views uh, on a level of uh, every one or two years. So I see this is a little bit contradicting of um, how Jörg is, is looking at it, since you would usually try to describe your business in such a generic way uh, that this is actually a stable thing. Uh, apparently, uh, there are certain uh, changes in the company and in the environment of the companies stimulating uh, these updates. Uh, second thing, uh, how can we tie this maybe to a more evidence-based uh, management of, uh, of these maps? Uh, we're looking into, well, guess what, uh, into mining techniques uh, in how far uh, this may help us mm -hmm. Uh, to collect evidence which can be mapped back into these maps, uh, such that it would also be a means for us to understand uh, whether things that are becoming more relevant or less relevant would still be represented on these high-level views uh, according to their actual importance in reality. Thank you very much, Jan. There's another uh, remark. Uh, th thank you for the presentation. Uh, regarding the uh, process mining, I have a question. If you want to relate, the uh, process maps and process mining, if you consider this as a, as a group of cows that's uh, running in the field and uh, as different processes, and we want to use the process mining to see how different groups goes uh, in different direction, how your life cycle position process mining uh, to help uh, managing the uh, business processes, because I haven't seen process mining in the life cycle uh, you mean on uh, the very early slide yes. that I showed? Uh, that is actually at the, maybe I put this slide up, just to make sure that we are all referring to the same thing. Yes. You mean this slide? Yes, that's. Yeah, so uh, we see this as part here on the left-hand side. So a technique that helps us to monitor and control processes. And uh, this is also the chapter of the book that covers this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Jan. Uh, Jan, you, you spend uh, what, eight years on looking at what makes a good process model, now you look at what makes a good process map, right? I would expect that can you translate 70, 80 percent of the findings to, to a good process map? Isn't that a process <coughs> model with you know, less, less details, less structure, etc. but a lot of the, the, the effects that we already know, colors, structure, highlighting, etc. wouldn't they translate readily or do they not? Yes, uh, there are some general concepts uh, that we see here as in many other uh, modeling principles. Um, so one of, thing of that relates to uh, how you visualize and, vi and visually highlight things. Essentially, this is uh, something that um, works here as much as it works, for instance, uh, with BPMN models. Uh, you see also considerations of ontological clarity pretty much apply here as well. So you try to uh, see that your concepts are actually orthogonal to one another and independent. And uh, what we see more and more, and this is also something that we are uh, more investigating uh, also in these more detailed models like BPMN, uh, is that uh, we see also as Jörg observes is uh, that the semantics are very important. So we need to look into how uh, the textual part of these models is actually being composed and how this textual part of the models uh, is actually good or bad. So we have certain techniques to uh, discuss this and to measure this and to point to uh, uh, to <laughs> deviance um, <laughs> and provide refactorings around this. This works here also on this very abstract level, maybe even better. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jan. Once again, a warm applause <laughs> for this insightful presentation.
so last but very, very much not least, the uh, presenter uh, here in our second session is Hayo uh, Rayas. Uh, um, welcome uh, to the stage. Uh, I'm very happy, uh, Hayo, that, uh, that you are here with us, uh, uh, also from, from Eindhoven. And I mentioned already you are uh, definitely one of the, the founding uh, fathers and also you are the executive director of the European uh, PPM Roundtable. Um, so uh, very uh, much look forward to your presentation here. Uh, Hayo is a professor uh, as well uh, in Eindhoven and uh, he's well known for his uh, work in business process management. He did his PhD in business process management, also has uh, a background uh, in industry. Uh, so uh, probably also the notion and the spirit of the BPM Roundtable to bring together both worlds, academia uh, and practice, uh, is something which uh, one can find also in, in your own work very much in your CV. I very much look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Hayo. Thank you. Thank you so much for introducing me in this way. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you are enjoying the series of talks uh, today. I thought uh, that they were very interesting, and I try to keep the same level of interestness, interestingness with these, at the same time watching the clock, knowing that you want to go lunch at some point. So let me directly tell you what the thing is that I like to talk about, it's the connection between strategy and business process management. And actually that is a, fits within a development that I think is very bright, uh, which tries to extend the meaningfulness, the impact of business process management uh, beyond perhaps directly operational things that you see in organizations. And I like to talk about the link with strategy, well, uh, um, I don't know what more important things we could talk about uh, than strategy, perhaps from a business perspective. Um, at the same time, there are notable difficulties, and I try to capture that difficulty with this uh, picture. Uh, you have to imagine that on the one hand side, you see, have this in this organi organization, you have these strategic considerations, you have these goals, targets, and at the other side of the chasm, you have operations, where people try to carry out work, deliver products, services, deal with customers. And as this picture suggests, it is not um, impossible to bridge that gap. And occasionally, people will make it. At the same time, um, there is a difficulty to align these things. That's a, become a famous word in the past years, alignment. And this is actually what I'm going to talk about. And what I will try to do in the next 10 minutes or so is to give you at least an idea of concepts that could help to bridge this gap, and also how technology could play a role there. And what, I should, uh, what I forgot to mention uh, well, uh, during the opening of this talk is that this is joint work by researchers uh, from the University of Pernambuco in Brazil, and I will show you uh, their faces uh, towards the end of my presentation. Now, um, there are some fundamental concepts that make this work, and one of these is it's a rather unfortunate story because it means there was work to do. And the work that it needs to be done is that there has to be a reflection on the link of what is happening in operations and how this actually uh, relates to these strategic considerations. And there are many models, there are many ways of linking actions, the things that people do in the, on the work floor, how they create outputs and that these outputs in, uh, another, on another level have an impact and all the way connect, hopefully, to your strategic consideration. And the work that I'm alluding to that needs to be done is that there has to be a reflection by people, by experts, on how, what this link is. Perhaps it doesn't have to be complete, but at least there has to be a continuous reflection on how work on the work floor relates to um, uh, strategic considerations. Now, um, we ha I'm, I'm emphasizing that this means work because we cannot do that automatically, at least not at this point. As soon as we can do that, we can also automatically perhaps develop strategies that are automatically executed. Uh, and I think that's a, a far cry from, from where we are now. Now, let's uh, suppose we have a certain reflection of these change of chains of connections between things that people do and how they may impact um, considerations of organizations on a higher level. Um, when we have done that, um, it makes sense to take a look at where these actions, where these actions come from. And I've here a very uh, sketchy image of a process 
A business process, don't imagine that it is captured in any kind of notation. It just is there to show you that there is a link with the business process. And a second fundamental concept is the work product. There are work products which are generated by business processes, which are the outcome of decisions by people or by systems. And the nature of these work products is at least the thing that we argue they are the start of this entire chain of the output of your process to, um, let's say, the question whether your strategy will actually be implemented, be executed in the way you uh, hope for that. These work products, you can think of decisions, um, permits, policies that you generate within processes, and they should reflect the strategy that you have as an organization. And I'm going to give you an example in a couple of minutes uh, what kind of work products I'm, I'm thinking of. This work products is a second fundamental concept and now comes um, an assumption that we also try to test in this type of research is that that is possible within organizations, within organizational processes, to distinguish activities which have a lot of impact on these work products and that there is a sort of an infrastructural activities which are less, um, less of an influence uh, than these, these, these work package producing activities. So on the one hand, you have these activities, which I'm going to show you now, which create work packages or influence the quality of work packages, and you have a core or infrastructural part of your business process. What is of interest in the concept that we propose are these work packages and the activities that create these work packages. Now, imagine during the execution of a process that we encounter, that we arrive at a particular point where we know that a, an important work package will be produced. And we know this because we have reflected at design time that there, are, that, that there is a certain activity that creates these things and that is going to be executed. Now, what the concept is that we propose is that at that time, there is a certain uh, technology that helps the people executing these activities make a decision which is aligned with the strategy of the organization and it does so um, in, in the, in at least uh, effectively by considering the specific content of this activity, the strategic goals, and then will tie to a system that will actually support people carrying out that activity in accordance with strategic considerations. I know it sounds very abstract, so I'm going to show you an example. We are going to show you an example which is based on a prototype that was uh, developed. It's called Roses. I had long discussions uh, with the PhD student who worked on this. Uh, he's from Brazil. He didn't like the name. He thought it was not macho enough, but uh, we didn't come, uh, came up with a good alternative. So it's called Rosas, and I always assured him that if we could, that are also things like manly, pink, and uh, etc. So we stuck with it. Um, and uh, we used a couple of tools. We used the Bonita Soft uh, BPMS, uh, BPM system. Uh, we used also an uh, analytical tool, Pentao, which is uh, Brazilian, and we set up the following system. The system um, was implemented in a particular situation where we assumed for a manufacturer of uh, travel bags uh, a number of strategic considerations, and what we did is we exactly try to map this entire chain of actions all the way to these strategic impacts. And I'm showing you a fragment here, and this fragment uh, shows you the following, that to achieve strategic success, um, the organization realized that it had to accomplish a couple of things. Uh, two of these were to improve their competitiveness um, in, with respect to uh, their cost performance, and on the other hand, also to increase their market presence in, so that other potential clients would recognize them as a company to work with. And if you would go down and look at what that would require, um, this organization would to have improved its operational efficiency on the one hand, it would also need to become more agile and could be easily, um, so that it would be easy, more easily to switch uh, between different opportunities as they arose. Now, um, to just simplify the example, I'm going to focus now on one particular element that feeds towards both of these strategic considerations, which is to reduce delivery time and costs. Because 
by delivery, uh, reducing costliness, of course you will feed into this improving operational efficiency, but also because when things become less costly, it will become also easier to once in a while change uh, the things you normally do uh, to exploit opportunities that arise. Now, when you go through, all, uh, through this entire chain towards the work products and the actions that you would like to uh, support, um, we are talking actually about a particular work product, a decision with which external, sorry, which, which uh, carriers to work with to transport these travel bags. You have to imagine in this situation, the organization has an internal fleet, and until this time, there was never a question whether they should work with external uh, transport carriers. Now, what the system does is that um, it supports people executing this activity where one of the decisions is to um, uh, with whom to cooperate with transporting these travel bags is to make the decision whether to work with the internal fleet or the external fleet and the system indeed helps people to make a, uh, a decision which is aligned with a strategic consideration. The system in this particular situation would distinguish based on the context of these activities, which of these orders or which of these uh, sets of bags that have to be transported are more susceptible, are more attractive to be carried by the internal fleet and which ones by, can't be contracted uh, by an external party. party. And this depends, could depend on all kinds of things. It could also depend on daily prices that these external providers have or the availability of the internal fleet at a particular time. Now, what is crucial here is that this is not a system that automates this decision. It's a system that helps to support these knowledge workers to take into account context, but also analytics that at this point help them to make decisions which are aligned with higher level goals within the organization. And at any point, um, people can deviate from this particular practice. As we heard this morning, doctors do that. And that is often uh, very fortunate for us that they don't stick with uh, the exact standard rules. Now, um, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. And uh, what I meant to show you is the conceptual basis and also at least a glimpse on the technology that could help to bridge this gap, which I've shown at the, uh, at the picture at the start. Um, we also think it has benefits in other directions. It helps to engage employees more closely in how to uh, pursue the goals of entire organizations other than executing only their piece of work. So it widens up the impact uh, of their work for themselves. Um, it helps to make them better decisions. Of course, there is a monitoring aspect to it. You can see in how far uh, these decisions are aligned when they deviate, perhaps also what the reasons are for these deviations. And uh, um, the assumption is that if you focus on these adapters, which focus on these activities that create work packages, if you are aware of these, it is also easy to maintain and update these as strategic considerations um, improve. In short, what I tried to tell you about is that we uh, uh, can move from that cliff jumping to foot, building footbridges between strategy and operational execution. Now what I promised at the start, I'm going to live right now. Uh, I want to acknowledge that this work is based on a lot of work and sweat uh, from Cesar Oliveira and his supervisor, Ricardo Lima. They work at the University of uh, Pernambuco in Brazil. And uh, I think this shows a couple of things to us as well. Uh, this morning we heard that we are in Europe uh, leading with respect to business process management. Um, and this is nice, and this is something that I think we should foster uh, and build upon. Um, and we can also we can see that we are not the only ones who see the value of using business process management. That's a good thing. It acknowledges that the things we are working on are relevant. It also means that we have to keep up and we have to uh, stay innovative and uh, try to work with the best other people, of course, in the world, wherever they are, but make sure that we uh, uh, prosper uh, due to insights that business process management can bring to us. Okay, I'd like to thank you for your attention. 
Thank you very much, Ayo, for your talk. Uh, very, very insightful and inspiring. And you're totally right. Uh, we, we had some uh, cooperation with Brazilian uh, universities and companies as well on BPM. There's this Global BPM Trends uh, seminar, uh, which some of us uh, already have presented. It's fascinating. They fill lecture halls of 1,000 people right away. So there's a huge interest. It's a huge booming uh, field. Absolutely. Uh, good cooperation there. Thank you very much for the presentation. Now, a couple of questions, please. Can I start? Okay. Oh. Uh, hi, very interesting. Um, let me go back to the theme of the conference, uh, driving innovation in a digital world. Just a try. Uh, if uh, the example that you showed mm -hmm. was uh, that somebody internal in the organization should make a decision where we, whether we should use an external carrier or an internal carrier. Uh, in an in a optimized digital world where everything is connected, 50 billion connected devices, la la la, everything, all, when you hear all these stories, would you somehow consider whether it would be possible for, a, for an external carrier to bid on a certain transport with different terms or conditions? Because that would make a very good basis for decision, and if you open up in that way, that would actually generate a, a potential very strong business value, and you would enable a strong competition among different actors. I can only say that's a fantastic idea, of course, to have this kind of dynamics uh, included in the, in, the, uh, in the process. I don't think it would be... Um, uh, I don't think any activity would, would be lend itself for this kind of dynamism, but this is actually a very good example where you would actually put bits out, and especially if you can do this, and if you can align yourself with organizations who are, uh, let's say, ready for making instantaneous offers for these things, so you have more or less perhaps not a, a relationship in the sense that you uh, have a strict understanding of when you will work together, but at least you have a framework of that you can rely on each other and that you will forward requests at certain points so that the other party can prepare for this. And then this is, of course, a fantastic way of dealing, uh, dealing with uh, this. Um, um, and there are many opportunities, I think, where this kind of dynamism or market uh, um, uh, awareness can be, can be exploited. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. So combining strategy aware with context aware business for us. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, X, Y, Z aware, right? <laughs> Is there any further uh, questions? Yeah, please. Yeah. please. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the interesting uh, presentation. Um, especially uh, why, uh, because uh, my um, imagination was you have the business model, then you have a path to the business, uh, business process modeling, then you have a path to the ID. ID uh, IT, but your uh, approach is a new one. You said you have the business process models, and about that you have new ideas for the business modeling or the strategy. Mm -hmm. And this also leads to our topic today. How can I uh, get innovations from the business process modeling? And I think it was a very good contrib contrib contribution for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if, if I may, may follow up on that, I th so the... the um, I have to emphasize that I think that the recognition of these activities, which you typically also see in the business process model, is fundamental for this approach. You have to do, mm -hmm. understand on an operational level what is going on. Uh, at the same time, uh, as you said, it is not so that we think that there must be emphasis on first implementing this entire business mm -hmm. process, but mm -hmm. focusing on activities which actually make sense to, to give priority to because they more directly than others uh, uh, help to make the connection between higher level goals and high level objectives. Yeah. yeah. Thank you again. Great, thank you very much. So, um, drawing first conclusions, we could definitely say that uh, deviation is, is very focal to, to our uh, morning sessions here. Uh, so the concept of deviations, we'll definitely come back to that in the, in the uh, afternoon sessions as well. But also we heard, uh, I think, quite some uh, interesting discussions and different presentations around the, around, around the role of process models, right? Uh, we, we, and uh, the role of standardization. And I think we already get, uh, got also some nice insights on uh, that it actually really depends, right? You cannot say you don't need models or you need models or you don't need standardization or you would need it. 
Yeah, for instance, Illustrator depends very much on the level of abstraction you are, you are looking at. Uh, it definitely also very much relates to the context, yeah, to the nature of business uh, and process we are, we are looking at. Um, so uh, I think it's very interesting what we already heard this, uh, this morning. Uh, and with this, uh, I don't want to draw any conclusions, but probably a, a quick summary and would like to uh, very much invite you to, uh, to lunch now. Uh, to have a nice lunch break uh, and to continue our discussions over lunch. So once again, warm applause to Hayo. Thank you very much. <laughs>